Okay, so we're just going to dive in and talk about a lot of definitions regarding human rights. So we can think of a laundry list of ideas or concepts when someone says rights. What do we think of when we're asked what are human rights? So if uh, you were to make a list on a piece of paper and I asked you list five types of rights, odds are you would come up with some of these that are listed here. Civil rights, political rights, civil liberties. Well, how are these things different? Do we take these things for granted? Are there such things as economic and social rights? Are these as important as political and civil rights? Can they be separated out? Do groups have rights or do, do just individuals have rights? So this whole concept of rights is a complicated one. So let's break apart some of these different types of rights. We all are familiar with the concept of civil rights, particularly here in the United States uh, and in the South in particular. So if we think of civil rights, what are we really saying? Civil rights, in order to be realized by individuals, requires po a positive act on the part of government. And so it's protection against some form of arbitrary or discriminatory treatment, either by the government or by other individuals. And so it is up to the government to ensure that these rights are realized by individuals. So voting rights, for example. And of course, we think of this a lot when we think of the civil rights movement. Well, what about political rights? What are these things? Political rights encapsulates all those things that give us a right to participate in government, whether it's voting, whether it is organized marches, or whether it simply is watching um, television and get, being involved in a discourse about government. All right, well then what are civil liberties? Civil liberties, think of those types of rights that are in the Bill of Rights. These are the types of powers or privileges granted to you and I as individuals so that we are not subject to the arbitrary treatment of government. Okay, and so one of the things to think about is the decline of civil liberties since 9-11. So the unlawful search and seizure, for example, the Fourth Amendment to our Constitution, protects us. It's a civil liberty we have that protects us from the unlawful search and seizure of our property, of our being, by the government. Well, after 9-11, some of those rights we have have been reduced in the name of national security. All right, we'll talk more about economic and social rights and groups and collective rights um, later. And your assignment this week uh, on the discussion board is going to ask you about a list of rights and which ones you would choose to keep. So keep that in mind as you move forward this week. If you're looking for information about human rights in the news, um, there are lots of organizations that will give you uh, daily updates about human rights, and you can subscribe to a, an email listserv, if you will. So Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, the International Red Cross, Doctors Without Borders, all these different groups have websites that you should be visiting as we go through the semester in order to get ideas about your topic of interest, um, about news in general, and many of these organizations also have internships. All right, well, let's get a, a little bit more theoretical when we think about what are human rights, all right? One thing to realize is that human rights issues are not new. The world history is full of examples of abuses going back to biblical times. However, for the most part, up until the 20th century, struggles that individual has uh, regarding their human rights has been the purview of the state and the state sovereignty system. The modern state system really is only about 500 years old, and up until the 20th century, anything that happens within states has been uh, considered off-limits to international intervention because this is the issue of state sovereignty. And state sovereignty is an argument that states use often when other states try to intervene on behalf of human rights. 
Um, but many of the human rights conflicts that we encounter since World War II has really shaken the, the, um, the foundations of this state sovereignty systems. Countries cannot avoid having to answer to one another, particularly in a Twitter and social media atmosphere that we live in today. All right, so state sovereignty is going to be one of those issues that's that's going to be hard to overcome. So, Jack Donnelly, um, you were to read uh, the posting that I put from his book, uh, Chapter One. When we think about uh, human rights, Jack Donnelly explains that a right refers to either rectitude or entitlement. We want to focus on someone having a right, that is, they're entitled. So A, person A has a right to whatever with respect to person B or state B. So A is the right holder. B is the one who is has a duty to provide that. And X is the object of the right. All right, so basically what we're saying is that there are different elements to human rights, that we have a right to something, life, for example, with respect to the state who has a duty to, to ensure that they don't violate that. However, we're also faced with something called the possession paradox. So the question is, is it possible to have and not have a right at the same time? And the answer to that is yes. Okay. So if you have a right to X, you're entitled to X. It's owed to you, belongs to you. And generally speaking, Donnelly and most other human rights scholars would say you have certain rights simply based on the fact that you're a human being. So the idea that you can have and not have a right at the same time, this possession paradox, is an interesting idea. If we all are humans, and we are, and based on that humanity, we have certain inalienable rights, let's say, we can have a right but that right can also be violated. So it's possible to have a right and not have a right at the same time. One claims a human right, Donnelly says, in the hope of ultimately creating a society that such claims will no longer be necessary. Where human rights are effectively protected, we continue to have human rights, but there's no need or occasion to use them. So for example, we have the right to life, but you and I generally don't have to use that right because we live in a society where the government doesn't arbitrarily take lives, generally speaking. So this is simply another way of stating the centrality of the possession paradox of human rights. The idea that we continue to have human rights even though we no longer have the need or the occasion to actually use them. All right. Um, Donnelly has a lot to say about how human rights are linked to modernity. And particularly, he argues that human rights are connected to the changes politically, economically, socially of what happened in the quote-unquote West. And all these lists of rights that we, we, we're going to be talking about, whether we're talking about civil rights, political rights, economic rights, social rights, all of these rights evolved over time. The claiming of these innate rights evolved over time because of changes in our society and, the, and how people relate to each other, because of technological changes, because of ideas. Remember constructivism that I talked about in the IR theory lectures? And because of political changes. So, for example, the right to property... That it's a, that's a political right, has led to the rights associated with economic, social, and cultural rights. And it's this idea that when people start to have property, they want other rights connected to economics, connected to their society and social um, interactions, as well as protection of their culture. Um, all right, I'm going to stop there, give you a break, and we're going to continue on with part two of this lecture in the next um, video.